Okay. So I'm going to go start to go through with the plant stuff. Um, you guys, please jump in. If you know something that I don't know, because I am a student just like y'all. So if there's something I missed or if I said something wrong, uh, just go ahead and let me know. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, and also, um, if you have questions, please stop me. I'm just going through this for y'all. So, well, for me too, it helps me remember a lot when I do this. So we'll start with the synapomorphies, and everyone still remembers what synapomorphies are from the first, uh, from last test, right? Uh, they're the different traits that different taxa share. So um, for the first one, and we can kind of see the the set here at the very beginning where there's arrows pointing. It's kind of like the shared one is the chlorophyll A and B. So all all the plants and green algae share that first synapomorphy chlorophyll A and B. And then this, um, you're going to need to know this uh, phylogeny. So you can see, and they're kind of reverse, but over here, the angiosperm, they're A, they have flowers. Also, he mentioned today that they have fruits as well. So that's something to know. Uh, the fruits and the flowers, they go together over here with angiosperm. The second one you can see with uh, the gymnosperm and the angiosperm, they share the synapomorphy, the seeds. And as we work back, you can see the ferns, gymnosperm, and angiosperm, they share the stomata. And we'll talk more about what stomata are in another question. And then finally, back here, the vascular tissue, you see that at, oh, I'm sorry, they share D. I got it mixed up. The stomata is up here. It's hard to see these little tiny letters, <clears throat> which makes sense because moss, you need vascular tissue to grow tall, and moss doesn't really grow that tall, so you know it doesn't have the vascular tissue, and we'll see why here in one of these um, slides that are coming up. I have so, a question on that. Yeah, go for it. What's up? Um, so on that chart thingy that we just went over, so like B right there, which is stomata, does that mean that mosses, ferns, gymnosperm, gymnosperms, and angiosperms have stomata? Yes, they all have stomata. That's what they share that that, um, that green algae up here does not have. And do you know why they have stomata? What why the green algae wouldn't and these four would? Um, does that have to do with the with the water? Um, yes, it does. Because algae is in water, it doesn't, the stomata is, the way that it functions is when it's open, it allows for gas exchange. But when the plant gets low on water, the stomata close. And when they close, it prevents water evaporation from the plant. Well, green algae doesn't have to worry about that. Um, Somebody ask uh, if you mix A and B. No, it's just the way that he has it listed. So if you look on A, he has it over here with angiosperm. And then B is all the way back here at the beginning and it's stomata. And then C is here, which is seeds. And then D is here, which is vascular tissue. I think he did that to kind of make you learn them. And so you don't learn them in order. You actually know why each has each synapomorphy. That makes, I hope that makes sense and answer that question. <clears throat> Okay, so the cuticle and the stomata, here we go with the stomata again, um, adapted for the organisms. So the cuticle is important because it's this waxy covering on the leaves that actually prevent uh, evaporation. So that's a, all, we know that all life began in water. So in order to move to the land, they, these plants had to develop adaptations that allowed them to survive on land. And one of them is they had to retain water because life is in water, right? Um, so the cuticle, that waxy substance, it prevents evaporation um, and it keeps the plant from drying out. So it kind of creates that water condition that the plants had before they moved to land. And then the stomata, like I talked about, it's on the underside of the leaves. And it what it does is it opens and allows for gas exchange into the plant because of course we know plants need CO2 to make to make their sugars and they need to release oxygen into the air. So that, that exchange happens, but when the plant gets low on water, like I said before, those, those will close and they'll keep the water from evaporating. Now the vascular tissue, that's an interesting thing here because what it does is, is it's that one in the synapomorphy I was talking about, it allows plants to grow tall because these cells, they, they grow and then you'll see this like here in this vessel element at functional maturity, the cells die, which means they hollow out and they allow uh, water to move through this vessel. And so you can transport, now you can transport water from the roots all the way up to the leaves. And so plants can get tall. They're not stuck on the ground anymore. Um, and that just, and you can see the different ones here from when, it, it, when they started out and how they've changed in, in different plants. So. 
Let's see. Again, like I said, he, he kept saying it cells, the cells in the vascular tissue, they're dead at functional maturity to allow, because if you think of, like you were saying, if you, if you have all the organelles in the way, then the water can't move through the vessel to get to the, to the other parts of the plant. So the seed is an adaptation to the terrestrial environment, because again, everything began in water, and so you still need that reproduction to kind of happen in water. So what you've got is you've got um, this, these seeds that have this, that it's like an amniotic egg almost, it's got it's got the water built into it. It's got it's all its nutrients in there. So in these water filled sacks. And so the, the seed can actually survive without being in water because it has water contained inside of it. And I added these things like the micro micro microsporangia because those are the sperm and the megasporangia, those are the eggs. And so I just added those into this because I thought they they might show up. Um, but here's here's how the seed is broken down. And so you've got the, so you can think of it like that, like he really they compared a lot to the amniotic egg with these three traits. You've got your protective waterproof covering. So it's kind of like the shell on an, on an egg. Um, and you have your nutrients and the nutrient delivery system that's in the endosperm in, a, in the seed. Um, and then you have your embryo in there. Oh, and he had asked, um, what else did it ask? So why do ferns, ferns and moss need water for reproduction because the, um, the way that they're designed is that the water will come onto the, onto the different seed, um, sperm and egg and it'll actually move the sperm, the water will move the sperm to the egg. Whereas with like uh, the pine and the trees and the daisies, it, they need wind to spread their gametophytes out. Uh, let's see, somebody has a question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You guys stay as long as you need to. It'll, I'll post it up on my YouTube page again when I'm done. <clears throat> so I hope that that makes sense. The water just moves the gametophytes in the ferns and moss, whereas the wind does it in pines and flowers. So the alternation of generation, I know this is kind of a hard one. He was talking about how it kind of trips people up. So I went ahead and put the little slide in here so it's easy to see. Um, and you can see, so this is you see the 2N with the pine tree, that's because it is the, um, it's the sporophyte, it's the diploid. So meaning it, it's got the two, the two chromosomes. So it's, it's a diploid um, and then it, but it's got these cones and it's got these, the, so the male and the female cones. And so this is, I'm gonna see if I can, my eyes are just getting old these days. So I'm gonna see if I can pull it up and show a little bit better. So you've got the microspore, and like I said, the microspore, and the reason I wrote it earlier is because that's the sperm. So here's your microspore, spore, it's coming out, and here's your megaspore coming, and then they are, for the wind actually moves them so that they're fertilized. And then this becomes, um, this is your haploid over here. So remember the red is gonna be diploid, and the blue is gonna be haploid. And you're always gonna look for, if you see N, N is the haploid generation, and 2N is the diploid generation. And so this is the alternation of generations. You've got one generation, two generations, one, and then they go back and forth. And then it's a little easier, I think, to see in, oh, did I not put, I didn't put the fern in here. I think it's a little easier to see in the, in the fern. But it's interesting because you've got, they're living in the same plant, basically. Um, you, you've got the, the first generation and the second generation, they're kind of living together here as they're, they're being pollinated, but they're living together. And that's kind of the thing with the, with like the ferns and I didn't, I wonder if I can pull up the, cause it's kind of easier I think to see with the ferns. Yeah, okay, let's So that's the little, the alternation of generations simplified with the sporophyte and you can see the 2N, so you know it's a diploid. Um, and then it goes through meiosis and it sends out its spores, which are the spores, whenever it releases spores into the environment, those spores are always um, haploid. And so they each have one set of the chromosomes. They then are, um, the gametophytes, they're, they're um, haploid here, so they only have one copy. And they undergo mitosis again, or sorry, these go undergo meiosis. These guys go undergo mitosis. And then they get fertilized, the gametes do. Fertilization makes you your, your diploid zygote once again, and then it grows into a sporophyte. And so they just alternate between, this is one generation is your sporophyte, your, two, your um, diploid 2N. And then one generation is your gametophyte, your 1N, your haploid generation. 
and it's really, I think it's the easiest to see here with the, um, the moss because you see this really distinctive, this is one generation and this is the haploid generation here. Growing out of it is the other, is the second generation. This is your diploid generation. So you've got your haploid on the bottom and your diploid on the top and they send out their spores and then they grow, uh, they undergo mitosis and then they grow into this um, haploid generation and then they come, they come together and through fertilization, and then they go back in and, um, and they become this diploid generation once again, which you see on the top. And so it's kind of confusing, I know, but it's really easy. Like I said, it's easy to see in the fern where you've got your haploid and your diploid generation. They live together. They're actually part of the same plant. Um, and this is the flowers. This is the way the flowers, you can see the, the red is your diploid generation again and the blue is your haploid generation. And this is your micro uh, sporangia, which is your the sp uh, sperm. And then they come in and they pollinate the egg, which is your megaspore. Um, and this is the next, the ne makes the next generation. Okay. So pollination syndrome, super easy. Uh, it just has to do with a plant, a, one plant developing a type of trait that attracts a specific type of pollinator. So you've got like the carry-on flowers, they smell like rotting flesh, they bring in those carry-on flies and the carry-on flies then pollinate um, the different carry-on plants because they take the pollen and they move it around. Same with the hummingbird and bee pollinating plants. It's just a trait that each plant has that makes it, um, makes it more likely to be pollinated by a very specific um, animal. The ecosystem services, this is kind of actually really interesting in my opinion. So you've got plants that are, um, I'm gonna go through the slides on this one because I think that it's easy to see what the slides do. Oh, look, and that's the, this is the fertilized egg. So that's, that's an easy one to see where you've got the protective coating and then the, the liquid and the embryo in there. Let's see. So first of all, uh, when, when we're talking about the ecosystem services. So this is just what our ecosystem does for us. Um, when, and so one thing is it maintains the atmosphere and it does that by producing oxygen for us to breathe and then taking CO2 out of the environment for us. And this is important to know because um, we don't want a buildup of CO2 in the environment, right? Because they talk about the greenhouse um, gas emissions. So they, the plants are really pulling that out for us is, is a huge thing. And they do that through the process of photosynthesis. Um, and they don't, uh, they don't want like the excess of O2, right? Because then that leads to the cellular respiration, but he doesn't really, I don't think you really need to know that. Um, but this is the, this is the very first ecosystem service they do for us is they give us oxygen to breathe and they take out CO2 from the environment. The next thing that they do is they absorb, absorb radi um, radioactive, radiative energy. So they basically help cool our environment through their evapotranspiration. Um, they, so they create this climate that they need in a sense, and they maintain that through this absorption of energy, but it actually helps us because it keeps us cooler and it keeps us from overheating. And that's, and you can feel that when you walk into a forest, it's like a lot cooler inside the trees. The next thing is this root system that holds the soil in place, because if you start losing those roots, then all you're going to get is you're going to get this, this like these layers of topsoil that we really need for agriculture and stuff to grow things, it's all just gonna wash away. And uh, in fact, a lot of our agricultural system does destroy that sadly, but we need that heavy, that topsoil that, that is actually maintained through this extensive root system. That's really important. So those are the three, we've got the, um, the three are maintaining our atmosphere and then the absorbing the radioactive energy and the root system that holds our soil in place. You know what I should have asked? Can y'all, when I switch screens, can y'all see the the PowerPoints? Oh no. <laughs> oh darn it. I wish you guys had told me that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I thought we were reading from the <laughs> word. No, I was trying to show you guys the on the PowerPoints. Oh darn, let me make sure. I'm glad I asked that because then I would just be screen share, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna see if I can do my whole screen. Okay. You guys tell me if, if y'all see it go back and forth now when I, and if y'all don't, okay. So are you seeing the PowerPoint now or no? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. 
yeah, okay. So now we're gonna switch back here. No, oh, I'm sorry. If you guys want me to go back through and show you any of the slides again, let me know and I'll redo some of anything that you want me to redo. Actually, let's go ahead and do that one real fast. I'll just show you the, the alternation of generations because that one's really, really important. That one's gonna that one's gonna be a lot on the test, I think, and it really is, is a huge key. Uh, let's see. So the fern, I was I was going here with the sporophyte and the two N. That's your um, your diploid generation right here. It undergoes meiosis, creating the spores, which are haploid. It releases those haploid in, and you can see the N, and so you know it's haploid. And then it creates these gametophytes. These are a haploid generation again. It undergoes mitosis to create more cells. These are your gametes. They get fertilized, and you're back to a 2N. So your alternation of generations is where you have um, you have the the diploid here with the 2N. And then you have the haploid with the one, the single N. And like I said, with the ferns, you can see it really clearly with this, the, the really tall stalks here being the haploid generation. And it actually lives um, this like relationship with this 2N generation. That's the second generation. So you have your haploid generation on bottom and you have your diploid generation on top. And so you can see this alternation of generations, they actually live together. And the same with the fern, this is, you've got your one generation here and then your second generation it's kind of it's down here and they live together you just don't see it looks like this in your haploid generation but they actually coincide at the same time um, and that's how they grow okay so we did the ecosystem services so the traits that are selected for and against of course that we select for um, plants that like the nightshade plants, he might actually bring that up. The nightshades are toxic plants to us, um, but we we bred them so that they that we, they would lose their toxicity, so that they would be safer for us to consume. Um, and it was like the way that we bred out aggression in animals. It's the same thing. We also increased sugar, and I should put and he said in water too. Oh, undo that. And water is what he said today. Increase, we increase sugar content and water content in our fruits and vegetables. So there was a there was a slide showing the peaches and how they swelled, and that was because we selected to make peaches uh, a little bit fuller. Humans are a global scale evolutionary force because, like everything, goes through evolution, right? But we are the only species that has done evolutionary change worldwide. Like we've basically, through agriculture and through other things. Um, we have we've basically dominated the planet and as we increase and use more land like 40 percent of the land is used for us 40 percent i'm sorry 40 percent of global photosynthesis is used for us that and that in our agricultural system and everything so it's it's huge that we've just kind of taken over the entire world like no other you're not going to see in any other species that just dominates worldwide Intro to animals. So there are three traits required for multicellularity. Um, those are easy, the cohesion proteins. So that just keeps our cells together. They stick together, the signal, cell signaling so they can communicate and cell differentiation. So that means that we have different cells that do different things. Um, they just do, they, we have cells that do various jobs in our body. And then these are the, these are the multicellularity. These are the ones that have um, evolved multicellularity. So what are animals, and actually he jotted it, he said some other things today, I'm going to grab my notes out and make sure I get this. So he said that, um, oh, you know what, and he said on the, on the evolutionary force to know that we modify ecosystems to make our own foods and make it so other animals can't live in those ecosystems. So that's something that we do, we, we manipulate ecosystems. So that goes back to why we're an evolutionary force. Um, so what are, oh, that was what So animals are, they're multicellular eukaryotes, but they're also, they're heterotrophic, which is really important because what that means is that we need to consume other things. We can't make our own food. Like heter, um, the plants are not heterotrophic. They make their own food, right? So they produce their primary producers, whereas animals are consumers, whether they're primary or all the way up to through tertiary consumers. Um, we rely on other things to make our food and we undergo internal digestion. So things like um, fungi, 
they they do digestion as well, but it's external digestion. They they digest things outside their body and then absorb nutrients. We do digestion inside of our bodies. Um, we have segmentation. That's a really big key too, and um, of course, body cavities, nervous systems. So the I think we talk about all this stuff a little bit more in detail. And then uh, we we're different because we don't have cell walls like plants have cell walls, and there's all like this are just kind of lists of things that make us the same and different. I think that's pretty easy. Just read through it. Closest living relative to animals, of course, is this uh, the the chinoflagellates, and um, within the animals, the sponges are basal clade. Do you guys remember what the basal clade is? Anybody need help with that one? Uh, no, I don't remember. So the, the basal clade is the one that uh, it's still in our group. Here, I'm going to pull up a slide and show you because he's going to. I know he's going to ask something about a basal clade. So it's still in the group of animals, but it's like the first split in the group of animals. So we'll go down here. Um, where's my animals? Um, so here we, if you guys, y'all can see this, right? The PowerPoint. Yes. The, the out group here, if you can see where the animalia, they, they cut off right here, right? So our out group is the chinoflagellates, right? And then the sponges, are our that's our those are our basal clade because they don't they, they just have like one synapomorphy that just kind of um see it just the sponges are way up here they had like this one synapomorphy and then they were selected out basically and so then that because because they only had that one synapomorphy that kind of has the same as the rest of the anim, of the animalia then they become the basal clade and and once you go into all these other synapomorphies, this is where the majority of the of the clade actually is. So you're always looking for that that very first. Not your you're, you're going to always have an out group. Um, it's not what it is. It's the very first once you get into the, that ma main clade. It's the very first singling out. Um, So he asks how the air organisms, um, how are, okay, so what is closest living relative to animals? Because basal clade has this organism similar to basal clade animals. Okay, so the, um, the chinoflagellates and the sponges, they're the same because in some ways. Now, the chinoflagellates are not animals because they lack one thing. They, um, they do have the cohesion proteins. Um, they resemble these collar cells and sponges. So they kind of look like sponges in some ways. And um, they can communicate, like the cells can communicate with each other. So they have two of the characteristics for being, um, when you go up here and you look at multicellularity. So they have the cohesion proteins and they have the cell signaling. They do not have cell differentiation. So that's the thing that sponges have that the chinoflagellates do not have is that, um, is that cell differentiation. Symmetry, uh, this is this is tied to the diploblastic and uh, when you look at the radial. So radial are diploblastic, meaning they have two germ layers. Um, radial symmetry, they can basically be cut any which way on their bodies and they will always have, be mirror images of each other. Hmm. So the bilateral symmetry, you see that in the, the triploblastic, which means they have three germ layers. And that's important to know. Diploblastic, radial symmetry, they have two germ layers. Triploblastic, they are bilateral symmetry, they have three germ layers. So starfish, they um, are not radial, they do not have radial symmetry because they have this like one pore on like one side of their body that's not the same. It's it's like one single pore that is not the same that makes them um, bilateral only. So they are actually, starfish are actually, they're like the one that trips people up because, let me see if I can find the slide, that one little pore, they look like they could be radi radially, radial symmetry, but they're not, they're here. So, um, oh, why did, why did they put that there? One second, let me make sure. Terrastomes. Yeah, it's a, it's a. 
Okay, so it's the radial symmetry in adults. Um, I don't understand why that's there, because it should be. It should be bilateral symmetry. Hmm. I'll have to ask the rest of the group because I'm pretty sure it was bilateral. Yeah, because he said, he was like, this is the one that's going to trip everyone up in the test. So we better make sure that we know for sure. Okay, go on here. Conodrime, sea star, sand dollars, two terrace domes, segmentation. Let me look at this little test thing that I have, because they have, yeah. See there, yeah, on the um, on on the homework activity that we did, it's starfish are. It said starfish had bilateral symmetry on our radial yeah, symmetry. I, I looked it up, and, and it says the sea stars or starfish. It says they're classified as bilaterally symmetrical, even though their adult forms are radially symmetrical. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. So that's the one that is really going to trip people up on it because they're they are bilaterally symmetrical. And it's that one little pore that he was talking about that they have. Um, good question. Thank you for clarifying that. Now we all know. Um, and so the bilateral symmetry, this the animals that are bilaterally symmetrical have these three traits, the triploblastic through the three germ layers. Cephalization, meaning that they have a head, and um, which allows for this in the central nervous system, and this the coelom, which is the body cavity. So those are the three main traits, and there'll be some more information about what those are here, I think, in a little bit. Yeah. So uh, again, we talked about the germ layers, two germ layers, three germ layers. Um, those those you'll need to really know for the. I'm sure he's going to ask that one. The cephalization is where you have a head at one end of the body. So animals that are radial, radially symmetry, have radial symmetry, they don't have a head at one end, obviously, because it can be cut any which way. Well, when you don't have a head, you can't really have a brain or a ganglia or a central nervous system. Um, so they don't have any of that, whereas bilateral symmetry, animals that have bilateral symmetry, they have that that central nervous system so that allows for more complex organs. <clears throat> the ganglia is just another word for it's like a small brain it's just a, it's a con it's like a bunch of neurons together but it is basically a brain. So here you can see the cephalization so here is an animal that is um, has radial symmetry and see there's no central, there's no head, there's no central area where you have a ganglia or a brain or central nervous system. All these are just kind of firing independently of each other. Whereas here, with an animal that has bilateral symmetry, you've got the ganglia, you've got the central nervous system. Um, and so that's what makes, that's one of the huge differences between radial symmetry, radial over here and bilateral symmetry. Uh, segmentation. It, it is just basically where different parts of the body are used for different, um, did I talk about, okay, uh, let's see if the sealant comes up. Segmentation, different parts of the body are used for different um, jobs. So they allow for different, um, you've got all these different limbs on these different animals that allow for different things. It also, it allows for different ways to digest food. I think I've listed all those out. So limbs allow for diverse array of ecological niches around consumption. So you can, when you've got all these different segmentations, you can eat food in different ways. And so animals have all these different segmentations and so they can actually eat in different ways. Um, and they also, segmentation allows for different types of reproductive strategies. Uh, so there's all these different ways to have animals, I mean, to have babies based on the segmentation of the animalia. The coelom is the body cavity that allows for the internal organ differentiation. So without the coelom, you, you wouldn't have space for organs. Uh, there's, there's three different types. There's a coelom in animals. They have, I'm going to show, I'll pull up the, pic, the image of this so you guys can see the different types of coelom or body cavities. 
So here are the types of body cavities. You have your coelomates. Um, it's almost enclosed, but it's not, it, I mean, it's almost open all the way, but it's just got this little bit of mesoderm and they're lined by mesoderm, but all the organs fit into these little cavities, whereas this is the gut where food goes through, but all the other organs go in here. Flatworms, they don't have their AC limit. They have no space for um, any kind of other organs. So they're not a very complex, you know, they don't have a complex organ system. And then the pseudocelomates, there's only this one animal, I can't remember what he said they were, but only, I think it's the roundworms. They're the only ones that are, that are pseudocelomate. Oops, sorry. So you have your first major split with the bilateral animals. Um, they're the protostomes and the deuterostomes. Protostomes, they have the blastopore. Uh, we'll open that up here too. So you got the. So you got this. This is your your blastopore. It's all your collection of cells. I'm sorry. This is your. Um, I'm sorry, guys. The blastopore is right here. This is your collection of cells, and then the blastopore is where they begin to indent. And that very first indentation, if it becomes the mouth, it's a protostome. But if it becomes the anus, it's a deuterostome. So it's just basically, is it forming the front of the body or the back of the body first? And you can see that here, the, protost the protostomes in this little um, area right here, these are all the protostomes. So there's a lot more pro protostomes than there are deuterostomes, but we're over here. We're actually gonna fall under this, uh, the, the chordates. We'll come down and branch out of the chordates. So we're here in the deuterostome lineage of the animals. And we'll see kind of the, when we, it'll go further into that little breakdown in, in a little bit. Chapter 13 already. So he was talking today, what is the most diverse group of animals? Well, it could be insects, but he also said it, there was a lot of options. So I'm gonna go show the, uh, the different kinds of options. He's like, there's gonna be a couple of possible answers. So 90% of all animals are protostomes. That could be one answer depending on how he asks the questions. 75%. So remember protostomes, when you have the blastopore, it, they've, it's forming the mouth first. So 90% of animals form the mouth first. They're protostomes. And out of those protostomes, 75% are insects. And out of those 75% that are insects, 40% are beetles. And so he said, it depends on how he asks the question, any of these answers are potentially correct. So just make sure you're reading the question and you know exactly what he's asking you for. Um, before you answer that question, I would read it a couple of times and make sure when he asks the animal so, question. Yes. So the answer could be protostomes or insects or beetles? It, it could be. He, he said, depending on, so here you could see all the red. If he asks you about any of these, the, the myriapods, the crustaceans, the whatever this one is, and the insects, which one makes up the most? You'd be, you know, you'd say insects. And so there's a kind of, there are, he said there was three possible answers depending on how he words the question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he said that today in the in the review. Uh, the difference between um, ecto ectodizoans and locotrophozoans with respect to their hard shells. So the locotrophozoans, they grow incrementally, meaning they're not gonna break out of their shells. Their shells just kind of grow over time and get a little bigger. And you can kind of see that like with the mollusks, they, they have rings and you can see how they grow in size, it's slow. I mean, it's, um, yeah, spaced out. Whereas the ecto, sorry, the ectizozoans, they grow by molting. And so they're the ones that have exoskeletons. They break, when they get too big for their exoskeletons, they, they break out of their, they molt out of their exoskeletons and then they have a new exoskeleton. And so they grow by molting. Um, this is, he didn't go over this in class, but it was in his lecture, so I put it in here. The, the local trophozoans, they have spiral cleavage, and that's how they grow. Um, the ectizozoans um, have radial cleavage, and I'm going to show you that slide just so you can kind of, because he didn't talk about it, but then he kind of mentioned it in the review. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if he's going to do, oh, maybe it's chapter 13. Mm. So here's the spiral cleavage and these are the leucotrophozoans and this is how they they grow here or they have spiral they grow with the spiral cleavage whereas this is 
this is the ectizozoans. They grow with the radial cleavage. And so that's what it looks like in case he shows you pictures on the test and asks you what it is. Uh, there is, this is a photosynthesizing animal. There is, the sea slugs can photosynthesize. They're, they are an animal that photosynthesize. And then how does segmentation explain arthropod diversity? So arthropods are, they're segmented. They're, each of their parts of their bodies, they do something special and they have like different, so we'll go here with this, um, go show you the picture. So here's arthropods, like you've got abdomen, you've got all these different parts that the segments of this animal all do different jobs. So it's not like a worm, you know, but there's actually, all these different segments like the legs and the body and here you've got the head the thorax the abdomen you've got all these segments that perform different body functions and so because arthropods there's so with arthropods there's so many different segments of the arthropods that each animal there's just like a vast number of animals that can do totally different things because of the segments of their bodies the different segments of bodies oh and that was another thing that he um he mentioned might be an answer to the arthropods because they're they're another really large group. And I'm gonna see if I can pull, let's see where's the where's the phylogeny. Because he mentioned arthropods is another answer for you know the largest animals, basically um, largest group of animals. Oh, I guess because there's like the I don't see the phylogeny form, but he mentioned arthropods being really important because of the number of arthropods that there are. Just trying to see if I can find that. Huh. I don't see that far left of me. I guess it's here, so you can you can see where it branches off. And this is, I mean, there's a there's a rather diverse group of the the arthropods. It's huge, and so there are another there are another large group of animals. Um, and you, and they're the ones that have, they have body segmentation, which is really, really important to know. I'm looking at these phylogenies, but making sure there's nothing else I need to address. Okay. When in doubt, always look at the phylogenies and you can look at like the synapomorphies and where they branch out and you can kind of see what animals group together and kind of what's important by looking at the phylogenies because they're, they're pretty much tell the whole story. Um, so these are the, the two most diverse lineages of the deuterostomes um, are the echinoderms and the chordates. So they, and in case you don't remember already, the, the deuterostomes, they have the blastopore becomes the anus and that is the deuterostome lineage. And the chordate is the largest clade in this group. Uh, so we'll go, I'm gonna go show you where the animals, this clade, cause these are another are important ones to see. So you've got, uh, these are the protostomes, right, that we talked about, and they're, they include the arthropods, the insects, this is, and you can see how much bigger the protostomes are, their group is, than the deuterostomes. We're a much smaller group than that. Um, and these are echinoderms. They are exclusively just the starfish, urchins, and sea cucumbers. That's all that you're going to find in this echinoderm clade. Uh, they have the spiny skins, that's what their name means. And you can see all the different things here uh, that they have where their larvae have bilateral symmetry. The adult echinoderms are radi radially sym symmetric, and that's what we found with the, the starfish. But here's that pore that I was talking about that makes them arguably bilaterally symmetrical. Um, so they're going to be, even though they are, even though echinoderms are bilateral when they're adult, I mean, a radial when they're adults, they have the larvae, larvae that's bilateral. So that's what trips people up there. <coughs> there we go, the chordates. I think that was what the question was about. Just go back to it. Yeah, the chordate is the largest clade, and includes some basal clades, including the vertebrates. So um, the vertebrates are our ancestral lineage, and um, we are in the chordate monophyletic group, which was what I was saying. So you can kind of see where we start to branch off down here. So this is the, the chordates 
come here. And I mean, we're such a small group. By the time you get down here and you're finally getting starting to get to us, like we're so small, like the main part. Yeah, what we think of as animals and humans and stuff is so small. So these are the four traits that all uh, chordates have at some point in development, whether they have it, you know, like we don't have some of these when we're when we're adults, but we have them all when we're in utero. So the pharyngeal slits, the pouch or pouches, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, the notochord, and the muscular postanal tail. So those are here. You can see all the different colors. The yellow is the, the pharyngeal slits and pouches. The blue is the dorsal hollow nerve cord. And then you, you see the notochord under there. And then the muscular postanal tail is over here. So this is this looks like you know a human embryo kind of. And you see we've got the postanal tail. We've got this the pharyngeal slits and everything. We've got all the parts. But as we get older, we lose. Of course, we lose our gills. We lose the tail. And so even though we're not going to have those as adults. We're still in the chordate clade because we have those as embryos. One second, guys. Sorry guys, I'm back. Um, I hope all that makes sense so far. Know the basal clade of the chordates as well as the synapomorphies of the vertebrates. The, the lancets and the tunicates are the two basal clades. And then of course the two synapomorphies are the anterior head and the large brain and the rigid internal skeleton. Let me go look at that here. So here's your, here's your, um, the basal clades and you see them. And again, the basal clade is when you see them, they're like the first split offs and they, and then you have all these other snapomorphies that become all this other group, but those are the very first split offs are the, are up here, these two. So the lancets and the tunicates are the, are the basal clade. And that's, again, that's the basal clade of the chordate group. Um, and then here's the two synapomorphies of the vertebrates. We've got the anterior head with the large brain. Um, and then we have this rigid internal skeleton enclosing our spinal cord or, you know, the animals do. So those are the two synapomorphies and you can see, let's see where you can see those. I wish I could zoom in more so I could see better. We got jaws, we got lungs. I'm sorry guys, I can't read these synapomorphies anymore. They're, they're so tiny on these clades and I'm trying to see where, where do I zoom in here we go I'm trying to trying to see where these synapomorphies happen so here we go I, is that the vertebrae that sends organs that's they don't have it they don't have it lungs Do any of you guys see these synapomorphies on here that I'm missing? I'm not seeing. I'm looking for these vertebrate ones and where to show you kind of where they branch off, but I'm not seeing them. I see the limbs, the lungs, the jaws. Oh, here's the, I'm sorry, here's the cranium. Here it is. So all the way up here at the beginning. So we have the cranium and the vertebrae, the paired sense organs. So we've got the synapomorphy here. Which is interesting. So there you got the hagfish and the lampreys are up there. Question. Yes, go for it. Oh, so in that, in like as an example, in the chart we were just looking at, yes. um, if we were to be identifying the basal place for this, would it be the flag, the lagfishes, and the lampreys? Here? That depends on what you're looking at. So that would be like the basal clade for this group. They're actually included in this, the vertebrate groups they're actually included because they're vertebrates so mm -hmm. they're not um they're the basal clade is going to be up here for this group oh, but if okay. you were looking at if you were looking at this group here i can't even say that word the nanthos the lot or whatever then they would be the basal clade for this group if that oh, makes okay. sense 
Yes. It's the one that's not included in what you're looking at. It's the very first split before what you're looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, how did JAWS evolve? What are the two draw lists? So JAWS evolved because they were just mod. There was the, like the modified gill arches, and they just slowly turned. They turned into that. And here, there's a picture to show you kind of. And here's the two. It asks for the two surviving jawless lineages, and there they are: the lampreys and the hagfish. So they're the they're the last ones that are jawless. And you can see these gill arches, and how they 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 kind of mirror what we have here. And so that's how this these became the jaws. They were the those original gill arches on the fish. When I asked him, he said that's all he wanted us to know. Oh, I don't know why I keep doing that. So it's not like he wants us to go into how or why or whatever. It's just basically they're, they were originally the gill arches. Why should you consider tetrapods a fish? So of course, you know, we know all life originated in the ocean. Um, you, when you look at lungfish, they're the first out group of the tetrapods and they're the closest living relatives. And then you've got like the forelimbs are their modified fins. So there's just kind of all these things that tie us together to or the you know the tetrapods they tie the tetrapods to the fish based on those kind of things that we see really basic stuff i did go to his office hours to clarify a lot of these things so i mean his the answers he's looking for are pretty simple a lot of this stuff so understand what traits uh, amphibians have that allow them to live on land and what traits they lack that make life challenging. So that that modified jawbone actually allows them to hear. And I mean, we don't really think about it, but that jawbone allows us to hear it. It's like worked into that. Um, so they they can hear on land now. Um, they have legs for walking on land, of course, and they develop lungs at some stage. You know, you have larvae that live in the water for a lot of them, but the, they have lungs as they get older that allows for gas exchange. Um, the problem is, is that they don't have amniotic eggs, so they still have to lay their eggs in water, so they still need the water for production, reproduction. So when you think back to the, like, tying everything together, when you think back to the seeds and the amniotic eggs and everything, all those seeds and amniotic eggs was so that we could live on land, where amphibians haven't evolved that characteristic yet, so they're still dependent on water for their re reproductive cycle. And that's a challenge. That's what the main challenge for them. So this is, he asked it again, you know, the amniotic egg, it's the same as the seed for the adaptation of land. You've got, and you can see the seed here, you've got your protective outer coating, which is here, it's the shell. Um, you've got your nutrients inside, which is the yolk and that nutrient delivery system. Um, and then you've got the embryo, like it's all here, rather than having to be in the water, it's, it's self-contained. And you can compare that, like I said, you can compare it with the seed and it's the same thing. You've got that protective coating on the outside. You've got the, this is the food storage, like the yolk sac. And then you've got, this is the embryo of the plant, which is the same as the embryo of the egg. Okay. So yeah, this is, I put, wrote this in here, due to the structure of the egg, the amniotes are fully free from the aquatic environment. They can reproduce without water, which is a huge deal. Um, what traits do some dinosaurs have that allow flight? It's all of these traits. And I'm gonna show you the slide because that's, I, I put the slide in here for this one because I felt like it was really important. Um, he, he said he's gonna, it's, all these traits are important. You've got feathers, the way that the, the snout and the brain and the eyes are, the, um, this elongated sternum here, though they produce heat in their tissues and they have these hollow bones. All birds we know are dinosaurs, right? So all of these traits between the feathers and everything else that this bird has going on that gives this bird, they're this dinosaur flight. Um, and they all play a role. So it's not just the feathers. So I feel like he's gonna be one of those multiple choice questions when they ask what traits allow for flight, come to this slide and make sure you're checking your traits because it's more than just the feathers. It's, you know, you got to know that your hollow bones and the structure of the head and um, just know all the, all these traits that allow for flight. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a multiple choice question. I'll be, I will be flabbergasted if it's not a multiple choice question on the test. 
Uh, so the amniotic egg, we know, is internalized with tetrapods like us um, because, you know, like the chicken, whatever, lays that egg that we saw earlier. But inside of us, this, the, all of everything that that embryo needs happens inside of us rather than we don't lay an egg. We actually have that in our uterus and we've got the, the protective coating, you know, we've got the, the water actually here. And there's still a yolk sac, which is an interesting characteristic because that that egg is attached to the mother's uterus and it's actually getting nutrients from the mom. Um, but it still has a yolk sac, which is interesting, right? So that's how we've internalized. This is this is the slide that you need to know to know that we've internalized these eggs and they're attached to our uterus now. And that's how we actually hatch eggs in a sense. What makes mammals unique? And um, a lot of people will jump on and say, well, fur and lactation. Yes, fur and lactation make, make mammals unique. However, tooth evolution is a huge part of what makes mammals unique. When you look at this, and I made it kind of small, but when you look at this and you're looking at the different teeth, like when you look at the fish and reptiles, look at how different, and gar and iguana, like look at how different these teeth are than when you come over here to mammals. Like there's, the, our teeth are so different, whether we're carnivores, or um, or herbivores, or sorry, herbivores or omnivores. Like it doesn't matter. Our teeth are so different from fish. So think of if we if if we evolved from fish, you know, we came out of the water. Like this is a huge difference from fish to what you're seeing with mammals. And so that's a really big key. Yeah, we have fur, we have lactation, but our teeth differentiation is a really big deal. Okay, humans. Do you guys have any questions so far? So stop me. Okay, so understand how modern humans are hominid, hominins, hominids, anthropoids, and primates. And he pointed to this slide as being one of the keys. Like really, we started talking about this like really big group. I wish I could just zoom in on this so much. So you can see, because we started out like looking at this huge group, right? And then we like zeroed in on the animals here, but then we're still looking at this ginormous group. And then, okay, so part of this animal, we're, we're down here in the chordates, right? And then when you cut out the chordates, like we're all the way down here. And then finally, you see the primates come out. And so that's how we're primates. We're in that clade of the primates. And then you come here and you see the primates split into this, and we're part of this hominid group, or the arthropods that would start here with the, the New World monkeys. So we've got arthropods, so we're part of this arthropod group. So we're part of primates, we're part of arthropods, or anthropods, I'm sorry, I'm saying it's not arthropods, it's anthropods. We're part of the anthropod group here, and then we're part of the hominid group, and then we're hominins. So that's how, that's how it breaks down, um, and that's how we're part of how we're, that's how it breaks down that we're part of the hominids, hominids, the anthropoids, and the primates. You see it all right there. Does that make sense I, to everybody? Sorry. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, sure. uh, based on the mammal uh, phylogenetic tree, the, the one on the far right, um, uh -huh. I know we had a quiz question last quiz about like which one's closely related to uh, us humans. Yeah. And I think I got like half credit for it because um, I put chimpanzee and the one on top of chimpanzee it's bonobos yeah was, was, was that the only two or was yes those are the only two they're they're our closest living cousins according and you can see that according to the phylogenetic tree because we share this common ancestor right here mm -hmm. the and that's our closest common ancestor like the next common ancestor that we have is back here with these guys but we the closest common ancestor that we have is here and we share that with the bonobos and the chimpanzees. Oh, okay. Well, we share it with the chim with their because they have another ancestor that we don't have, right? Right there mm -hmm. at that node. But yeah, they're our closest relatives. Oh, okay. That was that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, and then I, I laid out some characteristics so you can know that like all the primates, so hands and feet for grasping the nails and claws. Um, those are all important parts of being a primate. And then anthropoids, they have vision and so, uh, sociality. So we're so, the anthropoids are social creatures. And um, they have we have forward facing eyes and larger brains and three colored vision. So that's breaking down from going from the primates to the anthropoid group. And then 
when you cut, go down even further to the hominids, they're made up of apes and humans and they have large bodies. So when you think about how big um, apes are compared to other ones in the primate group, they're a lot bigger. Um, and they have even larger brains, but then when you get to the hominins, that when, that's when, I mean, that's us humans, right? So understand how the story of human evolution is a radiation, not a linear progression, and how the fossil record shows the patterns. So he was talking about how most of the species that we know, that we have fossil record for all these different species that are not our ancestors. Um, like, so we didn't descend in a linear fashion, everything kind of radiated out. And you can see that by the phylogenies and I'll show them to you what I mean here in a second. So there are a lot of fossils of the Homo sapiens, most of them died off. So when you look here, it didn't, it didn't progress like this in this linear fashion. What you had instead was, okay, there's this guy's a common ancestor, but it branched out to this guy and he didn't, he didn't make it right. That guy died off there. Uh, I said guy, but it was a whole group of, you know, whatever whole group of a species. And then you have this other one that branched off into these two clades. And then you have these, this one didn't survive, right? Just stopped there, but it went on over here and these stopped, but then you've got another one. So it's not, we didn't descend from this over here. That one has really has nothing to do with our lineage at all. It's not even in our lineage. We, we have nothing to do with this one. We just shared a common ancestor somewhere way back there, if that makes sense. So this is what he means by radial not linear. Okay. So understand how it is that the live, living Homo sapiens are not the only species to exist, though we're not the only, um, though we're the only remaining species. No, the currently expected model of recent evolution of humans is spread out of Africa. Right. So this is another thing that he wanted y'all to, or us, y'all. <laughs> I am a student too, I promise. Um, us to know all of this, like how this breaks down, like this is, this is the latest, you know, the most recent Homo sapiens here, but you've got all these other groups that, and some of these we didn't descend from, some of them we shared the common ancestors, but they'd have nothing to do with our lineage, like I said, and so this is a really important one to know, um, how they've got fossil records of all these groups, we just, it was actually just kind of luck and, and timing that allowed our lineage to continue and others didn't get to continue due to you know natural disasters or whatever was happening at the time. And so here's that out of Africa model. And he said, this is really what he wanted us to know about how it's, we started in Central Africa somewhere, our, our current population, um, and then just d extended out. And this happened like, like a group would move five or 10 miles away and start a new you know, colony. And then a hundred years later, they'd move another five or 10 miles. And, and this continued, continued over 70,000 years as in they radiated out away from that original spot. But when you look back to gene flow and you look at gene patterns, you'll find that in Africa, there's the highest diversity of genes. And that's because everything started in Africa. Um, as you get further away from Africa, you get less diversity. And that tells you that everything started in Africa because it has the highest diversity. Um, so this is the last question and this was kind of the one that he went over today and it was kind of a few things that he was talking about how understanding how culture influenced um, the evolution in humans so the what we saw with with humans is that you've got these groups making their banding together into small you know maybe 150 people and they're mostly families they share a language and they develop strategies to, to work together. And when they develop the strategies to work together, then they started exploiting resources in the environment. Um, they moved regularly. You know, you might have had some conflict, but uh, after a while, those groups became tied to agriculture. And that agriculture resulted in some evolution in the humans, like the way that we break down glucose because we were suddenly eating all these, you know, grass crops and the lactase in there, you see lactase persistence in some areas and other areas don't have it, the ability to break down the lactose and milk. And all of that is driven by agricultural and farming. And that developed because these bands, you know, they finally got together and they settled and they, they developed community together. Um, so 
the really big thing too is that we used those those areas for our own growth and so other species couldn't live there. But it actually was to our detriment in some ways because we lost nutrients when we were settling with agriculture and not being hunters and gatherers anymore. So you'll see the humans got shorter and there was a lot of different um, health issues that began to develop because they weren't getting the same nutrients that they were getting when they were hunters and gatherers. <clears throat> and then he was talking about how, you know, um, our culture is, is we inherit it both vertically and horizontally from our peers. So there's like a lot of like cultural interactions and how we're influenced by not just our parents, by but those around us. So that is everything. I know somebody asked me to go over the phylogeny and the activity. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, that was confusing because like I said earlier, he he kind of left out some synapomorphies and and um, I was like checking his synapomorphies against what he had written originally and they weren't checking out very well. But um, I, I can try and and go over it the best that I can if, if you guys are interested in me doing that. Let's see if I can. Yeah, sure thing. Um, does anybody need me to go over the uh, the phylogeny or is, is everyone cool? Because if you are, I'm just, I'm not gonna do it. it I thought it was really confusing. I mean, I'm good. <laughs> you good? Okay. Well, um, I know a lot of people are gonna listen to this. So if you have questions about it, I don't mind going over it with anybody else who has questions, who listens to this. If you, if you want to check in, I can go over it with you one-on-one. -on -one. I feel like explaining it in a group setting would be kind of difficult just because it is really extensive. Anyway. I hope this helps. Let me know if you guys have questions. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Thank you. Have a good night. You too.